since we talked last, you become famous or more famous. You're all over. You know, your 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 viewership is shot up. You're just you're just really going great guns. Is it going well for you? Do you feel that way? Um, I think you're thinking of the guy with the same name as me. He's a, he was a singer. He died when he was fifty. No, <laughs> 51. no, I'm thinking, Do you know no, that singer? No, no, I don't know. I never heard of a singer. What is it? Um, thank you for being a friend. Of course, I know that one. Yeah. Yes, and Andrew Gold. down the road and back again. Yeah, it's Andrew Gold. No, you um, you're on a. Oh, I shut off my phone because it wouldn't do it. But if it was on my phone, I'd show you you're on my podcast list. So I see you're... Oh, you're, you're fantastic. Yeah. Well, I love it. Yeah, it is going well. I was trying to deflect with my eponymous singer who who died and I spoke with his widow because it's just a weird thing having... And I suppose this can tie into to your book, Psych, because it, it, this thing of having the same name is quite a funny thing. But before I get into that, I was going to say, I heard this joke that I liked. Have you, did you want to hear a Freudian joke? Yes. Okay, let me remember it. How many Freudians does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. Two. One to change the light and the other to hold my mother. But ladder. <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> I, I have a horribly lame, lame one. Um, how many psychologists, is it, how many psychiatrists take to, to change a light bulb? How many? One, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> these are great people are going to be using these up and down oh. both both of our countries right this is great okay when we yeah I, we'll try to I okay think. yeah um so we're going to get into yeah i was going to get into well a lot of i mean psych is for firstly congratulations another brilliant but i love how you write i'm just sitting there at night oh, wanting to wake up my girlfriend and say oh there's another interesting point here but obviously oh. you know that wouldn't go down well but oh. yeah Thank, thank you very much. I finally got. I finally got last night. I got. I got the the actual physical copy because I'm in. I'm in Canada, so everything's slower. But I'm happy that I got the, the physical copy here. It looks beautiful. For anyone listening, looks it's a beautiful yellow hardback book with some puzzle pieces, which are the puzzle yes. pieces of the mind of the, of we, the human mind. The human Wait, mind. Wait, we, we started. Piece. Yeah, I'm putting this all in because you've complimented my show. I've got to now. Oh God, I hate that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm frantically thinking back on it, what I said, and I did. This, I don't think I said anything particularly embarrassing. It was bad. Some of the stuff you yeah, said it was really bad. Was, yeah. was bad. But it's, no, what, yeah. it, it can always be taken out if there's anything you think later. But I think it was just uh, <laughs> some Freudian jokes. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, I think they okay. were good. Yeah. Well, I was really. I, I'm interested in everything. Why was it talking about my name? Oh yeah, my name, Andrew Gold. There was that singer. He's got the same name. It's a weird thing that having the same name as someone, because it's it's almost irrelevant to your life, having a name, but there are very few people in the world who have that exact, uh, however minute, that exact same experience. Do you know what I mean? Is there another Paul Bloom? Do you, have you ever watched the TV, the, the, sorry, the movie Anchorman, Will Ferrell? Uh, oh, yeah, I think I saw bits of it and I can't remember if I actually watched it or not, but I know it, I know the film. A wonderful, wonderful film. It is based yeah. on, um, uh, a newscast, a California uh, newscaster with the name of Paul Bloom, oh. and and he he emailed me. Also, there's another psychologist, a young guy, young, very smart guy out of New York, uh, a, a, a research psychologist whose name is not only Paul Bloom but Paul A. Bloom, which is my middle initial, is also A. Wow! See, did and you feel like a kinship? Yeah, yeah. That's weird. I mean, some people get this in a different extent. Your name, I would guess, is not uncommon. No. No, there's a lot of golds in the world, and, and first name's common. Yeah, um, which is funny because they weren't golds to start with, and they, they tended to start as Goldsteins and Goldbergs, and yeah. we sort of met in the middle. My uh, my, my my friend, uh, David Pizarro, uh, shares the same name of quite a, quite a famous author. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and he's always pleased when he could ascend over to Google rankings over this person, but he will sort of, he worries about forever living in a Google This shadow. is my thing with the other Andrew Gold is that he does take up, I think like nine tenths of the first page of Google. And that's in the UK because he's American. So in America, it's probably 10 tenths of, of Google because he was, he was big and very few people know his name even then. So it's still, it's, it's quite insulting, I guess. But uh, he, he worked with the Beatles and people like that. So he was quite big back in the day but uh it's an interesting thought anyway the reason it's it's slightly relevant to psych and to you is because of this this idea of like the person and who we are and so what would happen 
and you write about this, of course, but what would happen if you did take like all the, let's say it's a computer of my head and made it into another, like put it in a computer or put it into a clone of me? What, what is that? Um, well, people don't entirely agree. I mean, the way you're framing this is if we could take all your memories and your personalities and your desires and your beliefs and your goals and capacities, put it into a machine, um, it would certainly be able to be exactly like you. Just, just that's almost by definition how we described it. But would it be you? So some people think that if you could do that, then you wouldn't worry about dying because you would persist. And people talk about this of uploading themselves onto the web and then if they die, they're creating, uh, creating uh, backups of themselves and so on. And a certain view of consciousness, that would just be you. So if you did that, there'd be two yous. And then if one of you died, there'd still be you persisting. I'm kind of skeptical. I think, I think uh, we are our brains. And you could duplicate a brain, but a duplicate isn't the same as the original. So uh, one way of putting it is if you uploaded all of me onto a robot or something, I still would not want to die, even though that robot. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, a book I must have read when I was like 11 or 12. It's probably one of the first sort of times I'd read something mildly pseudo intellectual or I don't know what and there was it was like all these different chapters and theories uh like each chapter was a different uh, mind puzzle of some sorts and one of them was like okay imagine that you are teleporting back and forward to Mars to do some sort of mining yeah. and you, you know this what I want um they they basically you know you get in a transporter you're there you go home at the end of the day and then one day when you're there on Mars you come to realize that the way the machine works is it just like obliterates you and reproduces you back on earth would you get in and it was horrifying for me when i was younger reading that concept because i'd feel like i'm i'm just definitely stuck on mars but it also surprises me when i read um your writing to to even believe that there are any psychologists who really believe it would literally be you because it seems so obvious to me that that's not us because there could be several of us at once if you cloned many of us and I'd be taught I wouldn't have that other person's eyes and experience so I very much share your view and um but not many not everybody does my, my wife strongly disagrees and everybody who watches Star Trek and thinks they'd walk into a transporter disagrees because what the transporter does is it basically kills you and creates a duplicate and 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 it kills you by making by shimmering and then it shimmers us so you get the illusion of somebody dead. but it could just as well kill you by 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 you know chopping your yeah. head off it just kills you but do we do we know that's the way and the star, for me was it star trek did you say do we know that's the way it works yes yes it's canon it sends it sends over information and then um and then it recreates you based on information which raises all sorts of questions if you had that technology why don't people constantly do backups of themselves so they don't worry about dying right, yeah it doesn't work and of course you could easily create a duplicate a duplicate is just it's just using the transporter half of it using the creation part without the disintegration part mm. yes yeah, so it doesn't make sense does it because you could just have you could have loads of you just with it, without disintegration there's loads of you That's i'm right. not seeing out of their eyes but then we get into yeah. a conundrum then because i suppose and this is what you write about as well but from a psychologist's point of view well it, sh it should all be there so the thing you're experiencing should all be there. So you should be able to experience it if you put it over there then. But that's a different experience. Yeah. I think I think the distinction has to be made between um between your individual experience, what it is like to be you, versus um something which which could manifest itself in different locations. So if you had a perfect uh identical twin. And imagine, which of course couldn't be, that they're in exactly your same brain right now. Um, he could be somewhere else and he'd have his own full experience and be just like you, but he wouldn't be you. The guy I'm talking to now couldn't see through the eyes of the identical twin. I find it frustrating. Not everybody agrees with me on this. And what they say is to me, and I'll say to you, is you're thinking of personal identity in too simple a way. What happens when you go to sleep? You go to sleep, you shut off your, suppose you go into a coma, then you wake up. You say, oh, I'm, I'm out of it. I'm back. But that, too, is kind of an illusion. What makes you identical to the person who fell into the coma? Well, same body, same brain. Is that enough? I don't know. <laughs> Suppose they could take your memories, put them in storage, and put them back into you. Would that, would that be a new person? Or So these are questions. These are sort of fundamental philosophical questions that, that, that of identity, connecting to sort of old school theories like John Locke's theory that it's all memory or Derek Parfit's theory that... Actually, so self uh, personal identity is an illusion. So, 
anyway. Yeah. It's, does that mean that but you you could argue that the the me the, the 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 me and you who started this conversation are not the same people who who started it. That's what somebody could argue. What they would say is we're we're very similar, extremely similar to the people who started it, um, in views and ideas and propensities and capacities. But we're not the same. And then if you talk to us ten years from now, there'll be a real a real big difference. And the idea these people argue that there's a fundamental continuity from you to the baby. That that is connected to your body so many years ago to the very old man later on. The idea that it's one person throughout is just an illusion. That's scary. A useful illusion, but illusion nonetheless. But I don't believe that. I'm 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 kind of a realist about personal identity. I suppose that's why it's also I guess when you're younger, you have this comforting idea that you know, when you first start learning about death and stuff, you have this comforting idea that, well, I won't care by then. I'll be this older person who's long gotten used to the idea of of leaving this world and I won't care anymore um and I think the like with with every year I'm now about to turn 34 I know that's not um but it's middle aged if I live to around 70 uh so I start thinking about these things and I'm certainly no more ready to go than when I was 15 in fact it's more of a tragedy because I've built up more memories and things like that I'm I'm worth <laughs> more than that 15 year old idiot so uh, I, and I guess that's probably because I'm not him. I'm, I, I, I almost, I almost want to push him away and go like, "You listen, mate. You, you go and die. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm, I want to live." I feel. I feel that. Um, that uh, first thing I find it uh, really adorable that you call your own death a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> just, it probably is. It, it probably. It probably would. It would be. It would be. It's just I, very rare to hear somebody acknowledge. I've, I've been watching. It I've been rewatching <laughs> Frasier for the first time since I was a kid, and I forgot okay. how good it is. But also, I'm finding. Um, and, and I'm sad to find this isn't something I'm proud of, but I'm finding similarities in my egotism. Uh, to, but I, I suppose that's why Frasier related to so many people, why it resonated, because we all have that kind of ego that he had and then he was just an idiot deep down and um so yeah so which which brother are you more like <laughs> oh well i remember reading that they made that niles was made to make frazier more relatable they like they had to bring niles in oh that's really yeah, interesting. he was the more extreme yeah. one to make frazier more like the rest of us and he is he is a little bit more yeah. able to indulge in sports and like the fun things most of us like um so i think i relate much more to frazier but i think i think most of us deep down do yeah. As I'm older, I'm, I think I relate to the father. It's just, you know, it's sad. The crest, the crusty old yeah, father. Yeah, but he's he's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, just to connect it to psychology, there's happiness research, which finds surprisingly that happiness goes on a great uh, U-shaped curve. So you're still on your way down. The typical pattern is uh, it goes down with age until about mid-50s, and then that's the lowest. And then for some reason, it creeps up again. And for many people, the happiest years of their lives are in their 80s and in, in sort of in pretty old age, um, up until, you know, there's serious failings of health. But, but on average, old people are very happy. And um, you might think, well, what about all the death looming over them, which they have to be conscious of? And I think your actually younger self was right. Uh, you're, just take, you're just not there yet that there probably is a point when you're quite old where you, you, for many of us, many, many of them, I guess, they become, they become comfortable with the idea of, of death. Wow. It's, it's a funny thought. I, I find myself thinking about like, um, do, do you guys get like Sir David Attenborough? Is he a sir? I think he is. I, I, I th I'm sure he is a sir. And, um, and I, I yeah, I, I, I think I must've seen something on TV yeah. about him. Well, about he's, him. Well, there's all the animal stuff and, I think he's 95. Yeah. And I think he, he still goes around in like helicopters and things and goes out and does, but it, it's a weird thing because he, he must know that, okay, guys, see you tomorrow probably, but maybe not, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, it's, it's an interesting question of what it's like to be very old, but still, still together and living a life and just the, the awareness that, that death is coming statistically sooner or later, you know, when you're 95, you know there are not that many years left i wonder if it's um naive of me to be thinking well that's down to lower expectations as you get older less comparison with your peers and things like that it might be one 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 argument about why we get happier as we age past a certain point is um david brooks talks about i think i'm getting this right um resume virtues like you know your how you're schooling how much money you make what kind of jobs you have how many papers you've written how how many followers your your podcast has and so on 
versus eulogy virtues, which is, you know, how much have you loved people? How much have you supported them? Your relationships, your, the sort of things people say at a eulogy. Nobody says your H index at a eulogy. Nobody, nobody gives your sort of a Apple podcast ranking on a eulogy. And, and so when you're older, you're focusing on your eulogy, uh, uh, virtues right. and, God. Maybe there could be a satisfaction at you. Sound yeah, horrified. Yeah, I am. I think I do. I have a real problem. Uh, I, I know everyone does, but I think I, more than most, I have a bit of a problem with with mortality and and stuff. There's very much of a, of a Jewish stick to, to to your attitudes. Your death, calling your death a tragedy. <laughs> your worries about mortality. There's very there's very much a sort of wood, the Woody Allen I've, thing there. I've grown like up it. on uh, not so much Woody Allen. I've seen obviously seen his films, but Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I've actually been um, I've actually been rewatching uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm just uh, as a very as sort of a, an insomnia show for very late. I can't let go. and and I, I I love the um, I mean to try to desperately bring it back to say there's a lot of psychology in in of human relations in this, which is this this uh, this extremely offensive view of human relations where Larry's the character who um, who takes what we all we he takes sort of a, a an everyday hypocrisy that we all live with and exposes it and so it was hated by everybody <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot of psychology in those programs i think a really similar one is louis as in louis ck's series and there's so much philosophy in that one i always remember this bit where uh he's suffering from heartache and he complains it was to quite an older guy who then said to him, like, I, I wish I had heartbreak, you know, what, what, like, enjoy it. There's that much emotion, the feelings you have. And, and I guess that yeah. also feels like Jewish shtick. And Louis sometimes feels like that, but he's not Jewish, I don't think, yep. is he? But he gets some of that. Yep. I think uh, th there, there's, I've, Noam Chomsky said this, and, and I think, uh, I think you're probably echoing a lot of other people that you could, that, and it's a bit of humility about my, my field of study, which is, I think you could learn an enormous, he said, you can learn an enormous amount more about human nature by reading novels than reading a psychology textbook. And I think I would extend that to a good TV series or, you know, a, a good movies, which, uh, psychology teaches us a lot about memory and language and development and, and behavioral genetics and, and, uh, happiness research and all that, but to know how people act and react, to know about love and heartbreak and marriage and, and bullying and, and, you know, that sort of thing, you'd send somebody to a TV yeah, show. I think so. What about um, another point in your book? Because I was thinking of the Truman Show when you describe, and I sent you an email with loads of capital letters, and then um, I thought maybe, maybe I did, it didn't go down well, but about you not being real. No. Did you? No, I, I read that. I was, I was in the middle of something else when I read that. And I, but no, um, I, yeah, you were talking. I think in, in my chapter on consciousness, I talk about um, about skepticism, which is our own consciousness is incredibly salient to us. This is where what Rene Descartes got right, which is I could doubt anything. I could maybe I'm even in the matrix. Something I'm just all tied up in wires and everything. Maybe it's a sort of experience machine, but. I know that I, there's something like to be me. I know that I'm feeling the feeling of sitting on a chair. I'm listening to your voice. I'm thinking what to say and so on. That I know. For you, I'm not so sure. I think it's likely you're a person and you feel the same thing as me. You look like me. Um, I can't think of any good alternatives. But for all I know, you're a robot, you're an AI, or you're just empty inside. There's nobody home. Do you and you're, you're making expressions and you're saying things, but there's nothing. And I think everybody, every teenager goes through some sort of moment where they say, oh, no, maybe I'm the only sentient being around. <laughs> and the modern version of this is maybe it's a simulation. And under most versions of simulation, it's my, I'm just living in a simulated world. And everyone else is, uh, is just, you know, AI generated. Well, we know there are psychopaths. Right, um, and as many of them self-confessed, and many of them uh, diagnosed as such, and they seem to have a very different idea of the world to us. But then I'm also told that that is on a spectrum, so we've all got a bit of it. Yeah. So it is. I guess it is really frustrating. Does it frustrate you, given it's your life's work, to not be able to go into someone's head and really feel what they're thinking? Yeah, I, 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 I think, yeah, I, it, it does frustrate me. It, it. it I think it's your everyday situation where we often do pretty well at getting into other people's heads. You know, I could cook a meal for a friend and, you know, my friend might like it because I sort of guessed 
what tastes good to me probably tastes good to him. You have a conversation with somebody say, hey, I get what you mean. And you have, and the conversation flows and you have the feeling that we're on the same page here. Um, but, but then you get to, to people who are different from you. And, um, uh, I, I say in a book, you know, I'm a developmental psychologist. I give a lot to know what it's like to be a baby. That's once a baby, but I forget. I give a lot to know what it's like to be a four year old. You look at a four year old and there's crazy. What are they, what's it like to be one? Um, and I think as soon as you depart even a little bit from, from who you are, um, you know, I could say I know what it's like at some level to be, uh, to be, a, an ethnic minority. Uh, struck with prejudice or, or, or a woman dealing with sexism or whatever. But because I've, I, I've had my own experiences of, of, of shame and being, and people being terrible to me and so on. But do I really know? And I don't know. I, I, I think we should be skeptical about how good we are about putting ourselves in other people's shoes. And yeah, it's kind of frustrating. It's frustrating because it's, it's almost, I wouldn't say it's impossible. And I think this is one thing that literature does actually a really good novel makes you um gives you some inkling of what it's like to see the world through different eyes and again to some extent movies and tv shows and everything i don't know what it's like to be tony soprano a person like tony soprano but after watching the sopranos for so long maybe an inkling mm. unless all the people who wrote the books and the movies are also robots and they're just sort of project yeah you know, that's project. that's true mm. and of course how do i know i'm right when i say oh i know you know you tell me something which which happens to me, and it really st- happens to you. It really strikes a chord, and I say, "Man, I know just what you feel." Do I? You know, there's more and more research on consciousness that finds with um, even with sort of things that seem obvious to us, we see the world differently. So, um, so one example that people have been talking about a lot are there's apparently some people who have no visual imagery; they they can't close their eyes and call into their heads an image of something. And these people, there's there's a story on somebody famous had this, said he was quite like in his 30s, maybe, when he realized that other people have visual image. He was thought of like a metaphor. That, oh, I thought, you know, and, and that people really can image things in their head, and he couldn't. Um, there are people, there are men who are colorblind, most, mostly men who get colorblind, who don't know they're colorblind until quite, quite late. Um, some of us have inner voices in our heads, some less so. There's kind of an interesting range of conscious experience, conscious experience that we tend to miss out. It's funny. I was thinking. I actually, this is true. Last night, I was thinking about that, about uh, whether I have an an inner image because I always figured that I do, and I do think that I do, but I can get a bit um, anxious the more I sort of think about it, and then I start to doubt myself. Wait, is that an image I'm seeing in my head, or am I thinking it? And then, because I was interviewing you tomorrow, yesterday your face came very vividly to my brain as i as i lay in bed yeah. with my with my girlfriend and uh i decided that yes i can in fact uh, see images in my head one one test which psychologists use which is actually very interesting for for different reasons but the role of imagery is that if i ask you to count the windows on where you live what most people do is they start at you know they start at the door and they walk and mentally walk around their house or their apartment or flat and just count things as you go on. And for tasks like that, you sort of have to let the images carry you through. That's interesting. I like that. Um, and and as you said, I could envision myself walking through my um, flat with all the mold on the ceiling, which is driving me crazy. But that's quite quite the, quite the, the image. Um, I think I'm low visual imagery. I can. I, I know I have it. I can do things like that. I know um, sometimes uh, uh, a face uh, can pop into my head, but sometimes it can't. Sometimes I, I, I think of somebody I know very well, but I can't make their face appear mm-hmm. in my head. Yeah. Um, then there's then there's something which is maybe less studied, which is um, auditory imagery. It's a funny term, but but so um, for a lot of songs, I can hear the songs in my head. Like I could hear the end of Stairway to Heaven if I choose. And um, and I think the other people, probably musicians, have this far more vivid. You ask them to listen to a song in their head, they'll listen to it and it will take exactly the same time as the song. But the point is that I'm listening to sounds that I myself cannot make from the voice, from instrumental and so on. So it truly is a sort of sensory experience. Is there a suggestion in that some people, are, that it's a spectrum and that some people have better auditory 
uh, imagining and some people have better visual and some people, some are probably more written and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think, um, I think, I think plainly visual imagery is sort of different from person to person and a lot of other traits of sort of everyday experience. Like here's another one um, where some people, you know, think of their lives as a story. I'm not sure this is conscious experience the same way, but some people, it's interesting. Some people think of their lives as a story to have a narrative of themselves. Um, maybe it's rags to riches. Maybe it's it's a series of humiliations that get worse and worse. Maybe it's this, oh, I did this, then I did this. And we're encouraged to generate these stories. So, you know, if it was a different, you know, you, somebody asked me, well, how do you become a psychologist? Well, blah, 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 blah. You know, how did the two of you get together, I ask? And da, 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 you have a story. But other people don't think that way. They don't naturally have stories. Their life is just one thing after another. Good thing, bad thing. But there's no narrative. And uh, I think that's a big individual difference. I think we're being... Because firstly, I have that. And obviously, my my narrative ends in tragedy, as we've established, um, unfortunately. <laughs> it ends with death, which which for you, at, at, at is an increasing tragedy as you become more powerful and accrue more valuable experiences. <laughs> a tragedy both for myself and and for the world uh, when, whenever <laughs> the world, <laughs> the world yes. has lost the, the, pod, the podcasting audience the podcasting <laughs> audience has lost a true great today um, well hopefully not well I won't be reporting on it anyway when it happens maybe a clone of me um, no. will be I do feel like we're encouraged more to value that second type of um, uh, experience with you know living in the now uh, two seconds of like real experience, a lot of Buddhism and meditation and stuff, and and yeah. w I'm sure there are ma loads of values and merits to that. It 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 just does not seem to be for me. I I I, I like not living in the moment and and complaining and like scatty brain all over the place. You know, you're you're anti mindfulness. I think so. Yeah. Are you into mindfulness? I'm a, I've tried meditation at various times in my life and I've had friends who, who strongly encourage it and I've been encouraged to go to meditation retreats and everything. And I, I, um, maybe the fact that it's so badly suited for me means I'm the person who'd benefit most from it. But the shorter answer is no, I, I'm not, I'm not a meditator. I'm not into mindfulness. And like you, I'll, I'll defend my anti mindfulness a bit, which is, um, it's certainly fine for me to go for a walk and go for a walk in a little bit and pick up some things and go for it and just, just, uh, just, you know, ex experience each moment. But I get a lot of listen to podcasts as I walk or plan thinking about something, planning something, writing something in my head. You know, I think somebody who only lives in the present, how could they anticipate? How could they plan? How could they, they ruminate over the past and draw lessons from it? You know, we, ha we have this consciousness for a reason. And and one of the reasons is you get to do stuff with it. Um, I'm also against the you, you know. There's um. Uh, did you ever hear of the Buddhist vacuum cleaner? No. It, it comes with no attachments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I'm I'm actually in favor of attachments. I think uh, I think one problem with a certain mode of living, certain life advice is it doesn't give you it doesn't give space for special connections with those you love. And I actually think that's part and parcel of a life well lived. Yeah, I like that. I, I it actually frustrates me that the it, it does seem to be a, like the mindfulness camp that they have a monopoly over the culture of like this is the thing to do: mindfulness, yeah. minimalism, not having any attachments, not having any stuff, not having any emotion. And I just sort of want to be like, well, you know what? A lot of us are not doing that stuff, and we're fine. And you seem to not be that fine because you're telling all of us how to do more. You know, I'm sure mindfulness, obviously. I mean, I know it works for a lot of people. But uh, I think more people need to speak up and say, hey, it's also, it's also okay to be Larry David. There's many ways to live a life. And, and uh, I, 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 pretty much, I, I strongly agree with you. I think that in some way it's very useful to put, to put many options in front of people because people might thrive with some and not others. And mindfulness and the sort of, you know, um, this, our, our stoicism, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's sibling. So it's stoicism are, are reasonable ways to live for many people. But there's other ways to live. There's other options. Um, there's nothing entirely wrong with passion, with, with with love, with anger sometimes. So I think actually anger, which is, you know, kind of anathema to many Buddhists and many Stoics, has serves an incredibly valuable role. It's often a force for beneficial social change. And it's often actually an aspect of standing up for yourself. 
I wouldn't if if I could have have a uh, some surgery to ablate the anger from my mind. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't do it for my children either. I think um, I get the impression the Stoics have a lot of anger in them, and the rest of us do they? I thought. <laughs> You may know more about are this just particular Stoics? Like when you look at them, you just say these are angry people, or or do you think Stoicism as a place? I think for if anger? you feel the need to make your life about Stoicism, there must be something going oh, I wrong. See. Whereas the rest of because also the other thing, like in every psychology book I've ever read, and I mean all all two of them, and they've both been yours. Um, it, well, not not actually. This isn't in yours that much, but you do mention mind wandering, and mind wandering is always seen as this really negative thing. I'm writing a book now about the psychology of secrets, but that's only a working title because I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not qualified to call something the psychology of secrets. However, it's, it's about what it's like to keep secrets and stuff like that. And there's loads of evidence uh, of, of like, oh, it causes mind wandering and stuff. And it's like that is my favorite thing. I get immense pleasure from mind wandering and ruminating and plotting and scheming. Yeah, I, I think um, you're not alone. There's a nice study by uh, Dan Gilbert and Matthew Killingsworth where they, they gave people uh, an iPhone with an app and it would beep at random times. And when it beeps, they have to say what they were doing. And there was a lot of interesting things about the study. But 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 one of the things they were asked was, um, are you in the game? Are you focusing on the here and now? Are you mind wandering? Is you're, you're fantasizing or ruminating. And about half the time we're on earth and awake, we're mind wandering. Our heads are elsewhere. And... I refuse to think of that as essentially a glitch. I think rumination, planning, scheming is really the Where would we be without scheming? Mm. Well, no, all the Shakespeare books wouldn't have happened. Yeah. That's right. I love it. That's right. I, I mean, one thing you'll, you'll read in every good psychology book, inclu including mine, and regardless of whether or not it's good, is that emotions have a functional purpose. And, um, and there's this view. Uh, that, oh, we should try to eradicate emotions from our lives. For the view from the philosophies we're talking about, also sort of, you know, Mr. Spock, rationalist sort of view that emotions are, are bad for you. But emotions exist because they, um, they evolved because they lead to various advantages. And it's, it's good to be afraid. It keeps it of some things that are worth being afraid of. It's good to be, to be angry. It's good to feel, to feel passion, to feel gratitude. Sadness, happiness, they're there for a reason. Now, of course, we tend to think of when they go awry, uh, when they when they cause us problems and when we're scared of the wrong things and sad too much and so on. And that's perfectly sensible to try to get them under control and have them being appropriate. But um, the, the evolutionary psychiatrist, um, I think Randolph Nessie, says, everybody talks about having too much when people have too much anxiety. Because those people are in a psychiatrist's office and psychology, and they pick up self-help books and so on. Nobody talks enough about people with too little anxiety. He says, those people end up in prisons and morgues. If you're not afraid enough, if you're not anxious enough, you uh, you don't respond appropriately in the world, and that could be the end of you. There's a great line in your book, and I, I've, I've neglected to write it down, but it was somebody who had said, if our brains were simple enough uh what was it? Simple enough. We can you do you know it? I, I'm not going to get it right. If I, if um if our brains were simple. If our brains were simple enough to understand, then we wouldn't be smart enough to understand them. Yeah. Um, Emo Phillips has one, which is I it says something like, "I used to believe my brain was the most complicated object in the universe, and then I realized who's telling me <laughs> <Yes>. that." <laughs> so, I love so there, there's something. There's something seemingly paradoxical about using our our, our minds to understand our minds, mm. and and also but I was that's all we got. I guess I just want to. Do you think does does that mean that there's this paradox as well that we'll never be able to like it? Can you will we ever understand? I, I get that obviously the meat you talk about it as meat in our in our heads uh, or write about it I should say. <laughs> there, but there's that magic bit that we don't quite understand of like, but how does it make me me? Because it's just atoms and things wandering around. Do you think there'll ever be advancements where you know in science where we actually get it? I don't know. Um, I don't believe in magic. So some people, so some people say, you know, oh, there's some great metaphysical mystery here that we could never solve. I, I don't. I don't believe in metaphysics. I think that in the end, it's just a scientific problem like any other. But um, there are limits. There are going to be limits to what we can know. We're finite beings. 
you know, dogs can know about a lot of a lot of things, but dogs are never going to know about calculus. They're just not. They're not positioned in the world. They're not, they don't have the capacities for it. It might be that we are going to understand some range of things, and other things are going to be forever beyond us. And it could be not because it's magic or whatever spiritual, but just it's just too hard. Certain psychological problems, problems like how does you know a brain, a skull, a big machine made of meat give rise to conscious experience um to what extent is there is there something like free will and free choice and you know a, a theory of psychology a full complete theory of psychology might elude us just because it's too hard for us and this is true for any other science as well of course yeah until we really understand how the brain gives consciousness we can never really settle the free will um slash determinism um argument maybe i mean i i think that in some way regardless of how the details of that turn out it's pretty clear that there's sort of a um, a simple view of free will, which is we transcend the physical world. We transcend the laws of cause and effect. And I think that that's, that's just off the table. But I do think that there are sort of compatibilist notions where we acknowledge that we have more responsibilities. We can make choices and so on. At the same time, acknowledging that whatever we are, we're subject to the laws of the physical universe. Man, it's so frustrating because, yeah, we, we literally don't know if – we're at a point of like, okay, so we'll never quite get how consciousness arrives because it doesn't make sense to me because, like, as you say, you copy it, put it somewhere else, it's the same physical stuff, and yet it's different consciousness. Um, we'll never know how, probably uh, how the world came to be. That's another question. Like, I, I guess it's not as philosophical, but it's something we might never know. Or someone could be listening to this podcast because they're finding it sort of maybe they're, they're interested in niche 100 year old podcasts that give an insight into the world 100 years ago and just going god they didn't know those things those such simple things that we've since worked out yeah and a lot of problems when you look back on them um they were solved in a way that nobody expected so you know through much of our history people talked about a life force and what's the life force that distinguishes living things from non-living things and then and it's, the mystery's gone away, not because we've discovered the life force is this, but because as we thought about biological systems in a deeper way, the notion of a life force goes away. And we just understand some machines work, some, 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 sorry, physical things work some way, others work another way. Um, you know, there was a time when people asked, what's the force that animates motion, like a tree rising or something falling from the sky? And then the science development says, those are two different things. Don't 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 try to do a single theory to establish both of them. So I feel that to the extent there's going to be scientific progress, which almost certainly will be, we'll be asking different questions mm. in in, a, in 20 years than we are now. I want it to just happen. I want to know everything, everything now. Um, another part of your book. That, that's going... another that's another reason why your death will be a tragedy, <laughs> because of all the stuff, all the stuff that you don't get to know. Yeah. I'm. I'm never going to live this down. But but you're right. That is why it is. I, I hate that. I hate not knowing like the things they're going to discover in 50 years or 100 years or in 10,000 years. Um, and I find it deeply unfair. And I intend to live forever. Um, perhaps, I think the most viable method right now is some type of virtual reality that slows down your cognition or speeds it up maybe to such an extent that you experience the world really 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 slowly so you have the impression of living forever that's an interesting way to do it so you won't really live forever you'll just like your conscious memory will take a long time your body will, will be aging and your body ages for 50 years but you have say 500 you have a million years of experience during that yeah. time i would check into that before getting that done because <laughs> I, I could see it being maybe incredibly boring well then i'll opt out of it so yeah so what kind of future do you think so do you think a Blade Runner future, a horrible dystopian future? Do you think of us? I tend to, I'm an optimist. I tend to think of a Star Trek future. <laughs> I, th you know, we colonize the universe. Uh, uh, there's no human wants. We just, every, you know, I, pull Star I don't Trek think universe. we'll colonize the universe because it just feels like we already would have, or someone would have done, even with droids or computers. Of course, there are so many questions then, like, well, maybe it's been done and they're there and we don't yeah. know. Uh, and the, the yeah. space is so large that we don't even, we can't even see but it has been done and they're, or they're leaving us alone until we reach a certain point so there's so many different thoughts there uh but i guess mine is like uh, as much as it's what i want to happen it's actually horrifying 
because it's it's that sort of Wally one uh, where we're all overweight, lying yeah. on chairs with goggles on. Um, yeah. And but but inside those worlds, it would well it would also be awful because I suppose everything would start to feel a bit meaningless. But but at least I'd get to feel like I'm um, living a very long time. So David, the philosopher David Chalmers uh, argues that. If we got it, we plug ourselves into a full virtual reality, and it's a rich world where we interact with one another. There's a sense which is as real as our physical world, and uh, and we it, w- it wouldn't be a loss; it could be a gain. You can imagine a world, your world, where we're all plugged into these goggles and living these wonderful, rich lives with one another, while robots make sure the Earth itself is in good shape and kind of spray us occasionally. So, you know, kind of, we don't get bed sores, roll us over so we don't get bed sores. And it's, it's, it sounds awful because you want to do things in the real world. But so long as we're not all isolated in our own worlds, but interacting, um, I think it's real. I mean, if I get in an argument with a friend in person, and I get into an argument with a friend over social media or Twitter. I'm still, it's still real. I'm still arguing with somebody. It's just a different medium. I suppose people who are like really muscly in this life, they would be like, oh, you know, it's like I've got hair and I and you've got hair as well. And that's like good. And I'm a bit annoyed that um, technology has gotten to the point where they can replace people's hair. Cause it's like, I had, that was my thing that I've got hair. And I suppose people who are doing like fantastically in this life would all athletes and stuff would be a bit like, oh, this was my advantage, my physical body. And you're taking that away from me. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Mm. I never, I never <laughs> thought of it. The, the, the hair analogy is, is very, is very moving. Yeah. Oh, come on. Like you've got um, hair, right? So you, yes, you yes. must have thought that sometimes I got, I got about, hair. about right. hair technology. Right. So, 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 so the, 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 the people of hair are have this, this antipathy towards, towards Rogaine and, and hair replacement. The people, uh, the, the, the virile have an antipathy towards Viagra. The, and then, and it's just, it's, it's because, because all of a sudden you lose your, you lose your competitive advantage. Yeah. That's, I never, I actually honestly never, never thought of it. That Do you think way. I could be a philosopher? It's some equivalent of people. I think you are. Can a I come and work with you? Because I think I, I give like a non-academic route into stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if academics want a non-academic route to stuff. It's 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 uh, these are um, our deep questions. I, this connects us. This gets us into a topic everyone's talking about: Chat GPT. And the the question is: You have Chat GPT there, right? Mm. Oh, is this is this trans and you're looking LG- puzzled? LGBT. No, 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 no. This is um, the, the the artificial intelligence. Oh, yes. Right? Well, everyone's using it to do their homework. Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. There's a potential for a very comical discussion where I'm talking about AI and you're talking about LGBTQ <laughs> issues. And, uh, and and we go on for hours just, just constantly just confusing each other. Yeah. But no, I'm talking about AI. Okay. Um, and, and the question is, it relates to what you were saying, which is um, if your comparative advantage is you could write quick, easy to understand prose about current events, you are screwed. This is a machine that whatever it can do, it can, it can do that better than you. Maybe you need to check it over. And I think that, um, that as these things, as AIs get better and better, it's going to cause us to sort of rethink what, what it is to become special in this world. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm a linguist, right? I speak five languages. That was really some sort of competitive advantage about 10 years ago. Yeah. Nothing now. Waste of time. We may not be that far. I think it was in a Douglas uh, Adams book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yep. where he, they had this thing where you plug into your yes. ear and it's sort of a universal translator. It's like a thing. fish. Bumble fish or something. Bumble <laughs> something. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, yeah, we, we may not be so far away from that, in which case I'm very impressed with your ability to learn language, but you're right. That is the kind of thing that maybe you should have spent. You just spend your time like learning. Um, Tyler Cowen says gardening is a good physical skill. It's like gardening or dance are the sorts of things which prove surprisingly hard for robots and AI. But they'll get there. I mean, physical things were the first things to be replaced in like the industrial revolution. Yes, yes. But but one interesting, so you're right, if the physical thing is lifting heavy, if you're really good, if your competitive advantage is you could lift heavy boxes, well, you know, the forklift came along, I'm sorry. Uh, But if, if it is that you're a really good, I mean, what we don't have is robot butlers robot cooks 
robot nannies. And because the physical demand, the physical problems of dealing with a three dimensional physical world and doing things like, you know, opening a door for somebody turn it to be incredibly difficult. Well, surprisingly, things like playing chess turn out to be virtually trivial for a machine and writing prose and writing writing prose. I mean, the prose is, is as people say, is of mixed quality. And people point out a lot of bad examples for prose. But I, I, I have um, a seminar on moral psychology. And I took uh, the reading responses I gave. And I just asked uh, the machine chat GPT to answer them in the word using the word uh, a length I assign my students to. And these are not a responses. They're not perfect responses. They are they are sort of flavorless, not very interesting. But they're good B minus responses. And many students, so it really is going to change the academy as students could use this machine to to give answers. And it's going to change um the sort of journalistic mm-hmm. ecosphere as as these machines could just write articles. Not good articles, but not the worst either. They can't yet be probably Hopefully, but everyone wants to think this about their own job. But philosopher, the philosophy teachers, professors, and and podcasters. Oh, po- podcasters, I think, are safe for a while. Yeah, because um, the whole point is that it's not a robot. That's the whole point. So that's an. I mean, there's another issue, which is suppose it actually reaches the point where um, an AI can can engage, have the sort of engaging conversational capacities that you have. Will we still say, yeah, but I want to talk to a person? There's something about, uh, and, and I refuse to accept a substitute. Well, I find myself, if I'm thinking about podcasts in particular and my work, I find myself taking on a slightly different character depending on who I'm talking with. I do it in real life as well. So people call it a charmeleon because you're trying to charm, I suppose. And I, I suppose there's something vaguely psychopathic about it, which which I don't like, uh, but it, 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 it happens intuitively. And I suppose it happens to many of us as well. Um, yeah, and and this role in this episode, and when I speak to other academics, I sort of take on the role of the curious idiot, and it's like a journey to 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 knowledge through you, and it's the fallibility and the vulnerability. The vulnerability, I think, is something people I I, I would like to listen to, I, whereas a robot could imitate vulnerability, but I I don't think it would be believable. That's true, and that actually comes up in, in this is in in the issue of sex robots, and and you know the sex robots always seem whenever I hear it always seems like you know, part of a lineup for for a joke or something. But but there's a lot of lonely people in the world, um, men and women, who who suffer from a lack of romantic and sexual con- contact, and it's a form of misery. And I always find it puzzling that people think, oh, there, it sounds like incels, you know. You know what a bunch of losers, but I'd much rather be uh, poor than uh, than lonely. And we have a lot of compassion for the poor, so why not for the lonely? And people suggest that in various ways AI might solve the problem. They might solve the problem as some sort of chatbot therapist for people, friends maybe. Um, it solved the problem as possible sexual companions, possible romantic companions, possible uh, care for the elderly. And suppose it does a really good job at it. Now your question remains. I know it's only doing this because that's what it's programmed to do. So I have a friend who talks to me, and and the under when I have a friend who I'm having a conversation, the undercurrent of it is always he or she's chosen to talk to me. At her own free will, they value me. Um, if it's a machine, I don't have that. Even if everything else was exactly the same, I don't have that. And you wonder how much does that matter to people? Now, maybe not so much. People pay people for sex. They pay them for therapy. And you still have, and that still scratches an itch. So it can't be everything. The voluntary, the, not voluntary, is always voluntary, but the, the, the chosen nature of it. I remember a line from, uh, I don't remember the line exactly, but Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And that's a fascinating book, I think, to get an idea of what it is we find attractive about people and he seems to always be on about firstly it's like the differences and things but also it's i think he suggests it's that that one percent that a human being doesn't show to the rest of the world 
you know, you see the 99% of them, you see the how they smile, how they interact with others and all those things. And our curiosity is sort of insatiable. So when you get them into bed, you're seeing that 1% that is hidden from the world. It's that one thing that is just a bit different and unique. And that's the, that's the question we'd have for robots. You know, what it, it's not, I suppose that's vulnerability again, isn't it? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very nice, nice passage. I like that. I like there's a sense of the value of getting to really know somebody. I think you could debate over whether whether um, sex is the way to really know them. I don't think it's either it's either necessary nor is it enough. But but it is it is part of it. It's part um, of that the early days, isn't it? You know when you're just like I I need to just like breathe in this person. I need to know where was your first this and that. When did you first go to that? And I guess this, that sexual part. As you're completely right. It's not everything, but it's it's part of yeah. that thing that like no one else gets to have. I'm possessing that now. Yeah, we come with the long, long, long list of questions, and just every little thing. It is insatiable interest. Uh, you know, you're in a flush of true love when um, the other person tells you their dreams and you're interested. It's it's the highest sort of tolerance because, you know, other people's dreams are are scientifically proven, you know, it's boring thing in the world, you know. Really and are. and then and then there was like an apple, except it wasn't really an apple, like an orange, but it was hard. To, uh, and then it was like, oh, my God, I kill myself. But when you're in that first flush, oh, my God, tell yeah. me. Yeah. Tell me, yeah. tell me your dream. Well, you'd listen now if your partner was like, and then I was cheating on you. And then you're like, hang on, now yeah. I'm interested, but not in a, positive way about this that's, dream that's that's right that's yeah. that's right no that's more right. you only dreams. you're only interested in when it takes it bears upon upon you in one way or another good or Ex bad exactly yeah and then you say no more dreams for you i, I don't like yeah. what you're doing in them and all that um i want to get on to um how long do how long do we have do we have left because we started when did we start do you know we started a, a bit late so like i don't know 10 15 minutes does that work that would be great thank you uh yeah. yes I, yeah, yeah well i want to move on to like something a bit uh topical in your book and also because i remember you saying last time did you share an office with or, or, or next door to jordan peterson i am now at university of toronto and i'm in his office oh right oh, yeah, uh, he, has, he has left I left forgot, university I, of toronto i forgot he wasn't and, and I, I now i'm now in his office you're in yeah. his office you've usurped him no, no. I, he 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 uh, he retired. He's now an emeritus professor, and I, and I just got his office. In fact, I, I communicated with him about about like furniture stuff, and he very very politely replied, and we got some stuff fixed up. When we moved on to um, Toronto and Jordan Peterson, I think you got slightly because you're half Canadian, is that right? I think you, your accent. I heard a boot. I uh, I was uh, I was born in Montreal, born and raised in in Canada. Now back to Canada, but my mother uh, was American, and and I spent sort of half my existence in Boston, and then I went to Yale and spent you know over twenty years in the states. And before that, I was I was in Arizona. I was at MIT. So I think I I, I know I spent more than half my life in the states. But I, I am I am born in Canada and back in Canada now. So yeah, half. What do you think of? Um... And I am getting onto. I want to get onto. There's a race. There's a race part, and and obviously Jordan is. Oh, known, good. <laughs> Jordan's known for um, obviously these sort of anti woke stuff, and uh, I he, he's an interesting guy, isn't he? He's a very interesting guy. Um, I think whatever one thinks of him, he possesses some extraordinary gifts. He is, you know, an extremely powerful communicator. Um, he gives wonderful talks. He uh, he has this this style about him, which I think we could people who are in who are in the business of giving talks and presenting work could learn a lot from him. Separate from whatever the content, whatever one thinks about the content, there is something really, really quite impressive and powerful there. I've heard it said that he's um, a very good psychologist, uh, and it's it's when he talks about maybe more uh, social issues that there's more disagreement about about how he is. I am not, I'm not, I know people who are Jordan Peterson specialists and I'm not one of those. Um, I've read some, some parts of one of his books that was on therapy and it was very sensitive and very thoughtful. I've also seen him th say things, including things about psychology that I view as unfounded. And, and, uh, I think part of the issue is for everything he talks about, he does so with this enormous voice of authority and confidence. Which comes off as very persuasive and powerful, but but there's a sense of talking confidently about issues where one shouldn't talk confidently about, where where the facts are actually nuanced and complicated. I wonder if that's um, an issue 
of the internet a little bit and YouTube and stuff like that because I'm aware that my videos do better when I have a strong opinion and when I voice it with and, and that's not who I am I'm somebody who goes well I guess it could be this and it could be that and I, I, nobody's going oh I must go and follow the guy who's not quite sure of himself or what he has to say um, yeah but that's right that's right that's right Bloom has tentative notions about about the origin of of consciousness let's let's listen more to those tentative and uncertain ideas well, that's the thing, isn't it? I think. I think mm, go on. I think the word for that is audience capture. What you were talking about before, where um, where you sort of like uh, this is very Skinnerian thing, where you get you get reinforced for some things and not others, and you get reinforced for the bold, strong, often cruel, often dogmatic statements, and then some people want to do do more of those. It's really hard. I, I find my, myself in a in a difficult position actually because I I did more episodes. Uh, like what I'm doing with you right now before, more sort of uh, esoteric stuff that I really, you know, you really get into, in, and it's sort of, oh, I don't know what I think. But then I noticed, you know, I put out videos. You want to do stuff that people like. Yeah, well, yeah, well, of course, but <laughs> they don't, they don't I, like I, I cannot be offended by such honesty. <laughs> no, but, but yeah, but you, but you wouldn't, would, would, would you, Oh, I don't know. I remember. Oh, I remember Mike Malcolm Gladwell was talking about his dad, who who never um, appreciated Malcolm because Malcolm was so mainstream, and his father wrote these like incredibly uh, intellectual maths mathematics books that you know Malcolm said like four people read them, but he was very proud his father yeah. and wasn't proud of him because he was very populist. And I suppose yeah. y you wouldn't want to be like the ju uh, Justin Bieber of of uh, as close as you are. I mean, you are one of the most, I'm tripping over my words here because you are one of the most famous and beloved psychologists in the world, but but still you wouldn't want to be like a Justin Bieber psychologist. I definitely do not want to be the Justin Bieber of psychologists. That's in fact a sort of, a sort of easy one. Um, I think everybody wants, everybody wants a lot of things. Um, I think uh, uh, since I do communicate to the public, you want to be listened to, you want to be respected, you want to be liked. Um, I've read some interesting discussions, not that it's directly relevant given what I do, but but about fame. Um, Tim Ferriss has a very interesting article about it. And of all things, I listened to to Prince Harry's um, autobiography and found it very interesting. And I think a lot of people want to be famous. And um, I think there's a perfect, there's sort of a sweet spot of fame that's kind of wonderful, um, where where you you know where where people who people are drawn to you and you get things done in real life that you'd have problems otherwise but you're not harassed but then there's a certain level of fame and again i don't think any psychologist maybe except for jordan peterson has reached where where it really makes your life so much more complicated you have no privacy you have no peace of mind you start to distrust friendships there's issues of of physical threat looming over you and it's actually kind of a really rough life yeah I think so. I've always thought that. I mean, the, the, the internet fame, unless, again, unless you're YouTube, like unless you're Jordan Peterson, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is nice. And there's a lot of, I've heard that about micro influencers uh, and influencers and things. You know, whereas before, uh, if there's a famous person, Matthew McConaughey, Tom Cruise, whoever it is, like everyone's heard of him. It'd be very strange to find someone who didn't know who David Beckham was in England, for example. It'd be yeah. just. Uh, unusual but not everybody would be like a fan or that into them whereas you've got these people online yeah. who just have these huge audiences um and i can think of like people i work with like jordan harbinger uh he's he's one of the biggest podcasters in the world but i don't think a single person i know i hope i'm not insulting him by saying this but a single person i know here in england would know who he is that's a great kind of fame i think yeah there's a lot in that fame um i think of um a, a good example of that is uh scott alexander um, who writes um, Astral Astral Codex, or wrote Slate, Slate Star Codex. He's one of the most prominent rationalists in the world and has this enormous fan base, including me, people who really appreciate his writings. But but if you, if you have probably very few people have heard of him and there's that funny sort of fame, you know, I, I once, I once bumped into somebody, a psychologist, uh, not Jordan Peterson, who kind of was boasting about how famous he is. And, and I didn't say this, but I thought the most obscure character actor in in a rundown tv show that nobody watches has a thousand times more people knowing them than you do and we tend there tends to be this illusion of fame somebody should study this 
where, you know, I, 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 I write a really good book on, you know, I don't know how to properly can peaches. And a lot of people email me and I write me about it. I say, I'm so interested in you and say, oh my God, I'm a celebrity among the canned peaches crowd. But you don't realize that because you just see the people who notice you. The flip side of that, by the way, is being hated. So, so these people, they, they, they get, they say something on Twitter and, and they get a hundred people writing them saying, you're a jerk. And it's, it's devastating because the mind says the whole world hates me. I'm a pariah. Well, actually, you're just seeing this incredibly unrepresented sample. The whole world hasn't heard of you. Yeah. But just this little following. But your brain says, but if the whole world had heard of me, this small sample who hates me is is pretty accurate and they would all hate me. Yes. And also your brain um, is used to, is, I think, evolved for living in small scale societies. And um, and so enough people hate you. Say, oh, my God, I'm, I'm going to be run out of this this town this uh this hunter gatherer community and we're upon all die um psychologists describe what they call the spotlight effect which is that people tend to radically overestimate how much people care about them both good and bad oh yes yes and that's that thing where i i'm constantly speaking with like my partner or friends or whoever and they're saying oh god people are going to notice this thing in my hair or my t-shirt yes. like, no one no one cares but but we no do. one cares because they're all thinking about themselves yeah it's a world of narcissists, isn't it? I, I, what was like? I was. I was. Oh, I don't know if we've got time. Really. I was going to ask you all about race and color blindness and the word hypo descent, and <laughs> I've got all these things. Maybe we could do that. We could do it another time because I don't take up too much. I'm time. sure we could do that some other time. Yeah, we'll I'll get you on another time. Well, Paul Bloom, what? Wait, where should people get you? Just get your book everywhere, can't they? Psych. Oh yeah, book everywhere. But uh, if you go to paulbloom.net. I, I have a little description of the book and and some links. Mm. Well, I've loved it, and I think it is. It's like even people like me can understand it and enjoy it very easily. No, you do. You do have a, a beautiful way of writing, and I thought that last time with the sweet Thank spot, you. but people should definitely get as well. Um, and I thought that this time as well, I just find myself really, really enjoying it. It's just like nice to read and think about all that stuff in our heads. Thank you. So thank you for. Yeah, <laughs> I always on. I always enjoy talking with you. It's always fun. Oh, was a joy. Well, as this was a joy. Thank you, Paul. Join me on the edge for new episodes every week. Start watching right now.